Hello. And what a nice crowd we have in this spectacular part of the world. How many of you are from right around here? Yay. You know, I have such happy memories of being a little kid in South Florida. I mean, everybody talks about my dreadful childhood. And I, I think, I, do anybody, does anybody really have such a great childhood? But I just, uh, I have to say, um, I, I just, I'm so glad that I was born in Miami, Florida. I was very proud to have a father who was an attorney in Miami until he um, passed away uh, about 15 years ago. I lived in Coral Gables till I was about seven, and I conducted my first, very first scientific experiment as about a four-year-old in the backyard of our house. Uh, well, two things. I started off with a life of crime when I was four, only I was on the wrong side of the blue line at age four, because I had this brilliant idea that if I rolled up my little red wagon to the backyard of my neighbor's house and filled it with fruit from their trees, and then went around to their front door and sold it for a quarter, that was called 100% profit. And I got away with it. And I also developed the habit that if a neighbor came out while I was stealing their fruit, so don't tell anybody I did this as a child, um, that if I stood very still that they couldn't see me. <laughs> but my scientific experiment was I wondered if you peeled the rind off an orange and left it out in the sun for several days and ate it if it would be tasty. It wasn't. So, but I had a, you know, a great childhood here. I'm very glad I decided to have Scarpetta be from Dade County, from Miami, and that's part of my fun as I move forward in these books, as I roll back the clock and go backwards in time, and I write about flashbacks from her childhood, and you'll get to that in Flesh and Blood as the book begins to move, you know, a little bit towards the midpoint, and she's stuck in a car with Marino for an endless traffic jam. Um, it won't be endless for you, but it is for her being stuck in the car with Marino. And she starts having memories about helping her father out in his little grocery store in Miami when she was a child. And I think you're going to really enjoy learning more about what it was like for her to grow up here. So, and then of course, the biggest research I did, there were two real big areas of research I did for Flesh and Blood. One was with firearms, which took me to Texas on three different occasions, out on the big ranges that they have there that you can shoot these high-powered rifles up to a mile, not worry about, um, you know, cars or hitting people or anything like that. So I went out there with experts, but I also decided that Scarpetta was going to do something underwater again. I didn't even know what. But I just had this feeling. And so I said, you're going to have to bite the bullet and get back into scuba diving, which I had not done in 20-something years. And so I began my training down here a little bit over a year ago and uh, got recertified and did the advanced and started diving some of your shipwrecks and then went all the way up to Bermuda. I've been basically diving the Bermuda Triangle, and I haven't disappeared yet, so that's good news. Um, but that was a really remarkable experience. And while I was doing that, I got to revisit a lot of areas down here that I remember from my childhood, such as, how many of you have ever been to Shorty's Barbecue? Oh, yes. Yes. Now, that, that's worth coming all the way from Boston for. What I'd really like to do now, because we don't have a huge amount of time, is I know you guys are brave. So I want to I open the floor to have you ask me questions, and let's get into a conversation. Um, so who is going to be brave and raise their hand and get, get started on anything at all you want to ask about me or the characters? They allow me to speak for them when I'm on the road. So who's going to go first? Um, Yes, gentleman right there. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you for introducing me to one of my best friends, Dr. Scarpetta, who has always given me a moral kind of a standard to try to measure up. Well, that's nice of you to say. Thank you. And, and actually, without sounding pious or didactic or all these other things you're not supposed to be as a writer, um, I do think Scarpetta is a good moral. Uh, compass for people for a very simple reason, not because she's a goody two-shoes, because she's not, and her creator is even worse, but, but because there is one thing, there is a cardinal rule for Scarpetta. She can do almost anything she wants, but I will not let her violate this one rule, and it is a rule that guides my own life, and that is what you should never do is abuse power, because if you don't abuse power, you really won't do anything that 
that causes our world to be such a horrible place at times. Whether it's the way you treat the, the person waiting on your table, or the person who works for you, or the, it's whoever you have power over. And we all have power over somebody, no matter who you are. And then there's some people who have tremendous power over multitudes of people. But you should never abuse it just because you can. And we would not have the wars that we have. We would have very little of our troubles. So, um, yes. If I were going to cast the movie, who would play the main four characters? Um, I don't really have any huge people in mind for that. You know, there's a lot of people that could probably play a number of, of these great roles, because I do think they'd be fun roles. Even Scarpetta could probably be a number of really fine actresses, because the whole point would be whoever plays her should so become her that when we're looking at this person on screen, we're thinking Scarpetta and not thinking whoever. But I'm always open for suggestions. Anybody who wants to volunteer names, I will pass it on to the studio. Yes. Okay, first of all, thank you for coming to Miami. I'm a huge Scarpetta fan. Thank you. Was it difficult writing when Marino hurt Kay Scarpetta in one of the books? And was it difficult to come up with, do I keep them friends or do I separate them? Do they argue and just part? That was very difficult. I had to do some marriage counseling, so to speak. Um, and that was Book of the Dead when Marino did that really awful thing to Scarpetta when he was drunk and out of control. Um, and, you know, here's the real reason now, I do take responsibility for that particular action, which I, some people have been extremely upset about for good reason. But to be honest with you, what had happened in the series, because Book of the Dead, which was, I guess, like 2000, uh, I think it's 2007, when that came out, well, we were so into the Scarpetta series for 17 years at this point, and Marino, with his pining away for her, because he did from the get-go, and he became increasingly a bit of a jerk. Um, as we got, as the series moved on, and I finally got to a point, and this is a, this is a dilemma that series authors face. Um, probably people write all, you know, episodes for TV series, same thing. I had to do something with Marino. It was either get rid of him or so undo him that I could start him all over again. And so I basically picked him up like a vase and crashed him to the floor and Book of the Dead. And I said, you're either dead, buddy, or I'm starting you all over because I can't live with you like this anymore. He, if, you've, if, if, if any of you read the books leading right up to it, you know what I'm talking about from Blowfly on. Um, Marino, he's, he was, just became a bit of a rogue character. And I thought, I don't want to get rid of you. I don't see how you have this series without Pete Marino. So I think you would, many of you, if you've read the book since, would agree that Marino's a lot more fun to be around now. And Scarpetta has forgiven him, and I hope all of you will too. Um, yes? What books do you read to influence you? I read a lot of different types of books. It just very recently, like, the last two days, I've been on a plane where um, I really couldn't be working on the new Scarpetta book or anything else, so I was you know, just reading, enjoying reading. I was reading a biography of Dickens, and then I've read a study in Scarlett Conan Doyle, and I read some Sherlock Holmes, because now and then it's really fun to dip into the things that got all this started, and, and to realize that someone like Arthur Conan Doyle was... He is so progressive for his time. I mean, the stuff he was writing about that that Sherlock Holmes was doing with his experimenting, his deductive abilities, although the stories are rather archaic in many ways, it was just, it's very fresh. And it's, it's interesting because having spent 13 years now on the Jack the Ripper case, I can tell you that, that Sherlock Holmes knew a whole lot more about police investigations in 1887 with a study in Scarlet, a lot more than the police did when they were chasing the most notorious killer of all time. Um, and so, but I like histories. I, I read an eclectic, um, eclectic reading for novels. It could be just about anything. It could be a crime novel um, or it could be just a regular novel. Uh, so, but I tend to read a lot of nonfiction, particularly for my work. So, yes. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, hi, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I had a quick question. Since you've written over 20 volumes for this one story alone, is it, does it get easier to write for your characters or does it make it harder having so many books? It's, the, it, it's a, both. I mean, 
writing about Scarpetta, because li literally, you know, I first started researching Scarpetta 30 years ago. Can you believe that? 1984 was the first time I set foot in a medical examiner's office in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and so it is, it's a long time to live with a series. What's easier about it is you build on the layers of civilization that you've created. So you have more and more of a sense of who these people are and where and what they're from. And that is helpful. Um, what's more difficult about it is with each book, it's, it's not so much coming up with a new story because I go out and do research that gives me all kinds of great ideas. For example, you're going to find at the end of this book when Scarpetta does her famous scuba dive, um, and trust me, if you're scuba divers, you won't feel the same about it after this particular scene. That it's, uh, And I, I did this same dive, and while I was down there, I said, gotcha. I know what I'm going to do to you at the end of this book, and you're not going to speak to me the rest of the summer when I'm finished, And she, this, which is probably a true story. So, but what is tricky is, is having the backstory book to book so that you do pick up where you left off, but you don't do it in such a way that a brand new reader picks it up and goes, I have no idea what she's talking about. Because you, you can't, it's a real balancing act to inform the reader as if they've never read any of these books, to pick up where you left off so that you satisfy the readers who have been following it, and to also not overwhelm with too much backstory. It's, it's a lot of challenges, but I enjoy writing a series. I, um, I'm not tired of Scarpetta, so that, that makes it fun for me. And I, I go ahead, I, sorry. sorry. Um. Again, thank you for coming, and this is just fantastic to be able to come here. I'm actually from Richmond, so coming down here for grad school is fantastic. Cool. But, um, my question is, with your forensic research, what are your major sources that you're going to to learn about these new techniques, um, whether it be reading or going in person? Well, I'm very lucky that I have quite a network by now, and if I don't know somebody, I know somebody who knows somebody. So that, for example, when I wanted to do very sophisticated, high-technology firearms training for this new book, um, with, with some weapons, I know some of you have never seen at least one of these weapons that's in this book, and you might never see one, and you probably never shot one, um, because it's very unusual, and I do get word of things coming down the pike before most people do, and then I know people who can help set up, so I go out in the field with experts. What I don't do is go out in the field and do these things on my own because I always remember I was an English major, you know, I'm not Scarpetta, I'm not Lucy, but I do go out and do this type of training and, and the same thing with medical examiners. I use, I'm very good friends with the chief here in Broward County. In fact, not so long ago I was at the Dade County office as well. I do research in a lot of different facilities in this country and I've always been a big fan of the real people who do the real work. I love to go out and ride with the police. Um, in various places. So I always go out and do the same things I always did. And for anybody else who's interested in writing, just remember whatever it is that informed you enough to make you want to tell a story, if you're going to keep telling that story, don't ever stop looking into it because it changes and your perceptions change. And it's very important that you go out and live life so that you can tell very vivid stories about it. So who else... Um, yeah, anybody else wants to ask, but they got a mic set up in the middle to make it a little easy, but go ahead. Hi. Um, is there any stories that you covered as a reporter that you still draw on um, in your writing now, 22 books later in Scarpetta? Well, not so much stories um, when I was a journalist as that what, what's interesting to me when I look back on being a journalist is I can see my proclivities very early on because one of the earliest things I did is when they signed me the police beat at the Charlotte Observer, um, which was a sister paper of the Miami Herald back in those days, maybe still is, I'm not sure, was um, there were some guys that escaped from death row in Georgia and ended up right very close to where our newspaper was, and it was my beat, and a policeman had, a police officer had given me a piece of paper as I was walking down the hall, the leak that they were, that these convicts had ended up where, where we were. And of course, I ran around all night looking for them. I don't know what I thought I was going to do when I found them, because that was not a good idea. They'd already killed one of their compatriots whose body was found floating in the Catawba River. And when I figured out what hospital the body had been taken to, now this is when we all know where I was headed, 
and I'm sitting there it's late at night, and I'm determined to get more information about this particular case, and I wanted to know what they do to this guy. He breaks out of death row, they hacksaw their way out, and one of their death row buddies, they do this, they kill him. So I wanted to know, what did this body look like? So I called the hospital. I managed to get a night shift nurse on the phone. Now, I don't know if any of you are nurses, but I bet you wouldn't do what this one just did, because I said, D did you see the body? And she said, no, but it's in the morgue refrigerator. And I said, well, maybe could you just go down and look at it and tell me what you see? And I mean, you know, just pull the sheet back and just tell me what injuries that you see because, and I'm rattling off all this stuff. And she goes, okay. So she, you know, disappears. And then she comes back and she tells me the injuries about, it looks like a stomping death based on what was described. And I put all that in the newspaper, but I got her to go in the refrigerator. I mean, really, it's like 11 o'clock at night. Are you crazy? And she doesn't know me from Adam's house cat. And she's going down and looking, pulling back the sheet. I'd love to have that on videotape. So, but what was it about me? I don't know, except from the beginning, I wanted to know what the body had to say. And so that same junior reporter who was probably 23 years old at the time, who convinced that nurse, I wish I knew her name and I could thank her, um, to do that doesn't surprise me that I ended up working in a medical examiner's office. Yes? I don't really like microphones, so. That's okay, but it, they, you know, just stay back a little bit. All right. I'll project your voice and it can't hurt you. Better? But anyway, go ahead, I can hear you. Okay, um, I actually got introduced to you not through your books, but you did commentary on a murder on television that I ended up watching. So I'm just wondering, were there any real life events that sort of creeped you out in a little bit or sort of like helped you progress your story along? Um, well, a lot of stuff I do creeps me out. I mean, I, you know, I mean, really. It's, uh, it, it, you know, there's a lot of things I do, particularly, honestly, the worst thing is going to the medical examiner's office because it may shock you to know this, but I don't consider going into the morgue a good time. Um, I've, it's, no matter how many of these cases I have seen, I find them very difficult, they're painful, they make me sad. I usually am very extremely tired and down in the dumps at the end of the day, and they're not pleasant. I mean, um, you know, but I'll tell you a quick little anecdote about that that I try to remember no matter what I do <clears throat> for research. When I was working at the Emmy's office in Richmond, because I went to work there to learn so I could do what I'm you know, doing today, and I'd go down <clears throat> to the morgue every morning to help the pathologists. I would scribe and weigh organs and do anything they'd let me do because I just wanted to learn. And of course, it's not always pleasant. And this one given, this one day, there was a, what we used to very irreverently call a floater. You know, guy had fallen off into the river. And this is, this, I, I don't remember this person's name, but he'd been out in a boat with his little boy and he'd fallen overboard. And then he was found later, you know, much later in the Virginia summer. And of course, the minute you entered the building, you knew we had a guest who was not in the best condition, suffice it to say. It was really pretty awful. I mean, and I was getting on, I was on the elevator with one of the medical examiners. We were going down, and she was going to do this case, and I was going to assist her. And I was thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Because this is really terrible. And the, the, the stench is getting worse and worse and worse as the elevator's descending in the bowels of the building. And I looked at her, and I said, this woman medical examiner, I said, sometimes I don't know how you stand this. And she said, I always try to remember who the person was. And suddenly I saw a man with his little boy in a boat fishing on a beautiful summer morning in the middle of a river when he probably had a heart attack and went overboard. And I thought, that is who he is. He can't help the condition he's in now. Now you suck it up and go and don't complain. And I've always held that as my standard for how to deal with all this because someday I'm not going to be such a pretty picture either. And I would hope somebody would forgive me for it. Yes. Hi. First of all, welcome home. Thank you. Um, I'm a professor here at Miami Dade College, an English professor, and I'm one of your biggest fans. I've, I've followed Thank the you. series all the way through and I've read your other series as well. But I have to be honest, I I've gone to where I'm not sure if I like Lucy anymore. Um, Lucy's pushed every envelope. I know she's had a horrible childhood. Kay's done everything she can, you know, she could to, to help her and everything. But she's just gone so rogue, and I wonder, is she ever going to be happy? <laughs> 
I, but see, she thinks she is happy. It's the rest of us who are unhappy with her. Um, I don't know, which is the last book you've read with Lucy in it? Um, the very last one, I haven't picked okay. up this new one yet. Well, you won't like her much better than yeah. this one if it makes you feel any better. <laughs> so, no, Lucy's, um, Lucy is deliberately, I call her, she's a little amphibious. She's kind of not uh, on terra firma, and she doesn't really swim in the water. She's sort of an in-between of a lot of things. As, as Scarpetta says, she's sort of a sociopath light, although there's really probably no such thing. But, just, yeah, Lucy's Lucy, and it's... She is not going to get appreciably better because she has a teeny weeny little personality bug, just a little character disorder inside of her. Um, she's exactly who you want on your side. She'd do anything for you if she likes you. She'd do almost anything to you if she doesn't. Um, but she is a very necessary foil to Scarpetta because she put Scarpetta through her paces and has ever since she was 10 years old in postmortem when she was a brat. And I can't change her. You know, I've tried to improve Marino's eating habits and, and hygiene and hasn't gone very far either. <laughs> so these, it's a really funny thing about characters. And if any of you, for all the other writers here, is they will be what they want to be. And there comes a point where, like children, I guess you can't try to turn them into something they're not. So uh, I, here's how I feel about Lucy. I have a big fan of Lucy if she really were a person. I mean, I'd go, wow, that's a pretty incredible person, but I'd probably be, if I saw her at a party, I'm not so sure I'd have the nerve to go over and talk to her because I don't know what she would do. Scarpetta is intimidating too, but she would always be gracious. She's not the warmest person always because she's reserved, Tell you know her really well. But that's, yeah, I know what you mean by Lucy. And I'll talk to her and say that, you know, <laughs> you mentioned all this, but I promise, I'll, the minute I get on the plane, I'm going to start emailing her. And if I can ask sort of a second question real quickly, is your academy picking up any new cases now that kind of Jack the Ripper is, is um, slowing down, closing up? Oh, he's not closing down well, and you know what slowing I mean here. up. As far as your involvement in the... Mr. Ripper, are you kidding? What fun would he have at this stage of life if he didn't have me to harass? <laughs> Still, I'll just give you a quick Ripper update. So the, new re the remake of my Jack the Ripper book will be out next year. I've been working on it and researching it for the last 12 years. Um, but for those of you who are curious about what may be in it and what my opinions about the case are now, there, I just published a, just what's called a single on Amazon. It's basically a big op-ed piece. It's called Chasing the Ripper, which you can download. It's, it's like 45 pages, but I, I give you a bird's eye view of what I think about all this since I published the book the first time in 2002. And um, I am not done with him, trust me. So, okay, go ahead. How would you des describe your storytelling technique, and is it different from other authors? I think every author probably has their own very individualized technique for storytelling. Mine is very unusual. I would call it a journalist's approach in that I go out and do things as if I'm going to report on them. And that become, gets, that's where I get my story ideas. I do not use index cards. I don't use outlines. I wish I could. It'd make my life a lot less nervous if I knew where the hell I was going. When I start a book, I start with a scene. Once I've started doing research, um, I just, I, it's like I conjure up Scarpetta, where are you? And I try to envision her. And for example, in the new book, In Flesh and Blood, uh, for those of you who haven't read it yet, you'll find out it opens this beautiful, you know, summer morning in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to her birthday, and she's made a wonderful panzanella salad and her secret Bloody Marys, her secret mix, and she and Benton are having a lovely time in the backyard because they're going on vacation. They're coming down here. They're going to Miami. They're going to scuba dive and play tennis and do all these fun things. Well, you know that can't happen, right? No way. So I give you a few pages just to fake you out, and then, of course, the phone rings and all go, hell breaks loose. So... But that's, that's the, my process. I started a scene like this. I already knew what the crime scene was going to be. I knew about the firearm stuff. And then the other thing I do is I got to trick her. So I'm going to do this research, and then I'm going to plan a crime scene that it's like, let's see you figure this out, because this is really tough. And that's exactly what she confronts in the first crime scene, because the shooting death that she sees, this victim, when she looks at the wound, it seems to defy the laws of physics. She does not understand how this firearm injury could have occurred in the circumstances that that she is that she sees it just makes no sense 
Um, and then she sets about to try to put it all together. So I have a very organic and almost journalistic uh, style to writing. I zone, I just go off into the world and I let the characters tell the story and I listen to what they're saying and I write it down. That's really what I do. Thank you. Yes. I was a crime scene technician for Hialeah for 20 years. Cool. And I was wondering why you picked Hollywood. I was so jealous that you didn't. You <laughs> I didn't, didn't know you. Why didn't you call? Well, I didn't. I know. mean, come on, it's your fault. You actually, you actually went to my sister's house. I talked to you on the phone one time. Really? You went to my sister's house because she had a, a burglary in progress. And the detective took the phone down and so I could talk to you on the phone because I was such a big fan. And you, you talked to me on the phone and I, you were so nice on the phone. Oh, thank but, God. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you hate it if you hadn't no, been? You and then she stands up here and starts telling the story in front of everybody. You've been. <laughs> No, but what I, what I wanted to tell you was we all, all the girls that worked for me, I was their supervisor, we all traded your books and stuff after we read them because they were so accurate and they were so well written. In fact, sometimes I would read a book and say, can they do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I would hear about things, techniques and stuff that I didn't even know about that you were t writing about in the book and then I'd find out they can really do that. <laughs> well, I, tr I uh, you know, it just has to be within the realm of possibility. So I do, you know, I'm lucky that I find out a lot of the newest cool things and, and uh, try to put them in my books so that people get to see it. But Hollywood, I just happened to know some people there is how I ended up riding around with them. And um, it's never too late to ride with Hialeah, but you're probably not there anymore, no, right? I, I retired. So, well, then do it probably is too late to ride with Hialeah. Do you still ride with so. Hollywood? Do you still ride with Hollywood at all? I haven't, no. I haven't done that in quite a while, so you don't need to be threatened anymore. <laughs> so, but don't, it's very nice to... Don't to, ride with Hialeah anymore. Not, not, but it's very nice to see you, and for all of you, if there are any others who do the crime scene, uh, you know, crime scene techs or crime scene investigators, I think you all agree it is a hard thing to do this day and age. In particular, I have been to burglary scenes and other things um, down here where people have already collected all the evidence when you show up at the door because they watch TV. They've it's in little baggies and they've labeled it. I hit two of those in a row and um, of course not your sister, it had to be somebody else's scene. And I said to this person, why did you touch everything? And this person said, well, I watch TV and fingerprints aren't important anymore. I thought, well, your case isn't important anymore either because you just ruined it. So, yes, ma'am. Maybe this is a good question to end with as uh -oh. uh, the way you were introduced and how much the person said she loves death and all kinds of creepy stuff like that. But, you know, like, you think about the people that they never do figure out who killed them. Anyway, I was wondering, um, when you're cremated, you know, when somebody, when you're cremated, how, uh, has that process changed, like, like, since, like, the 60s? how hot they cremate you at, and how much of you is left? That Can they find out things still after your, you know? <laughs> um, well, okay. Yeah, um, the, physics you know, just in case the physics of the cremation... The murderer happens to be the cremation uh, person. The, the, phys know. the physics of cremation will have stayed the same. Generally, a, a crematorium oven gets up to about 1,800 degrees. And you're... What, I don't know, um, what else can I say about this? But I, one thing that I hope has changed is when I worked in the medical examiner's office in Virginia, they, the, the below ground level, even below the morgue, this is Dante's Inferno, and you get on this little itty bitty service elevator where you close the doors like, like this, you know, it's really creepy. And the guy who worked there, you don't even want to know what he looked like. Exactly. The anatomical division, and they would do cremations there. These are bodies donated to the medical school, and if they were unclaimed, they would cremate them in the oven down there. And the one thing that I hope they don't do anymore is they always kept the baseball bat in the corner. Um, not for the people who are alive, but when you came out of the oven, sometimes your pieces and parts were a little bigger than would fit in the box. And so the, that's where the baseball bat came in. And now that I've really Golly. depressed everybody. Renfield. <laughs> but it's your fault because you had to ask this question. So, Thank but you, so you know, much. so, you know, maybe there's some, you know, between cremation and donating your body to the body farm, ugh, I don't think so. But do people do ask me, you know what the body farm is, right? I can't believe all the people that want to know if I'm going to give my body to the body farm. And I said, no, 
for a very good reason. By the time I'm old enough to die, I plan to have had so much work done on me that I won't decompose. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to signing your books. Bring up Flesh and Blood if you have backlist and there's time at the end of the line. Come on up and I'll take care of you. I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.